Well, welcome back to our course, Computer Organization and Architecture. We're now getting into our second of three chapters that is part of this section where we're looking at arithmetic and logic. So last time we talked about number systems, we got familiar with um, binary, hexadecimal, and, and the decimal system, and a little bit, but very little focus on thinking about the octal system, which is just um, base seven. Um, so we have either a 16, um, the, the 10 that we use in decimal um, is one to zero to eight or, or zero to zero to seven, um, depending on how you want to be thinking about it, and the, the binary zero and one. So what do we talk about for this chapter? Here's a summary and we'll come back to it at the, at the very end. We're going to be talking about the ALU, the arithmetic logic unit. And so this is a, um, a huge workhorse that is part of the processor. And so there's a lot of um, things that go on in the processor to move things around. So it can be doing things in the arithmetic logic, logic unit. It's reprogrammable. So that's all um, pretty interesting. We'll talk about integer, integer representation, um, different approaches, sign magnitude, um, Two's complement. We can talk. We'll talk about range extension and fixed point representation. We'll also talk about floating point representation. First of all, the principles, the IEEE standard. Then we'll talk about integer arithmetic, um, both um, negative um, and positive. How we do addition of subtraction plus multiplication and division, and plus and finally floating point arithmetic. Um, arithmetic operations, addition and subtraction, multiplication and division, precision consideration, the IEEE standard for binary, um, floating point arithmetic. And so that would be a um, fair amount of material where we're covering here. So first of all, the ALU is the part of the computer that actually performs arithmetic and logic operations on data. All the other elements of the computer system control, control unit Registers, memory, I.O. are there mainly to bring data into the ALU for it to process and then to take the results back out. We have, in a sense, reached the core or essence of a computer when we consider the ALU. An ALU and indeed all electronic components in the computer are based on the, the use of simple digital logic devices that can store binary digits and perform simple Boolean logic operations. Here's a picture um, at a high level block level, what an ALU looks like, trying to focus on the inputs and outputs. So figure 11.1 indicates in general terms how the ALU is interconnected with the rest of the processor. Operands for arithmetic and logic operations are presented to the ALU in registers and the results of the operation are stored and registered. These registers are temporary storage locations within the processor that are connected by a single pass to the ALU. Um, for example, you could go back and look at figure 1.6 if you'd like. The ALU may also set flags in the result of the operation. For example, an overflow flag is set to one if the result of a computation exceeds the length of the register into which it is to be stored. The flag values are also stored in registers within the processor. The processor provides signals that control the operation of the ALU and the movement of the data into and out of the ALU. Well, let's talk about integer representation. In the binary number system, arbitrary numbers can be re represented with just the digits zero and one, the minus sign for negative numbers and the period or radix point for, for numbers with a fractional component. For purposes of computer storage and processing, however, we do not have the benefit of special symbols for the minus sign and, and radix point. Only binary digits, that is zero and one, may be used to represent numbers. If we are limited to non-negative integers, then the representation is as straightforward. There are several alternative conventions used to represent negatives as well as positive integers, all of which have involved treating the, the most significant, that is the leftmost bit in the, the word as the, the sign bit, 
If the sign bit is zero, the number is positive. If the sign bit is one, the number is negative. The simplest form of representation that employs a sign bit is a, the sign magnitude representation. In an n bit word, the, the rightmost n minus one bit holds the magnitude of the integer. There are several drawbacks to sign magnitude representation. One is that addition and subtraction require a con consideration of both the sign of the number and the relative magnitudes to carry out the required operation. This should become clear in the, the discussion in section 11.3, so you can keep that in mind. Another drawback is that there are two representations for zero. So that might seem a little bit odd. This is inconvenient because it is slightly more difficult to test for zero. That is an operation performed frequently on computers than it, if, if there were a single representation. Because of these drawbacks, sign magnitude representation is, is, is rarely used in implementing the integer position of the ELU. Instead, the most common scheme is a two's complement representation. So like sign magnitude, two's complement representation uses the most significant bit as a sign bit, making it easy to test whether an integer is positive or negative. It differs from the, the use of the sign magnitude representation and the way that the other bits are interpreted. Table 11.1 .1 that we're showing here highlights key characteristics of the two's complement representation in, ar in arithmetic, which are elaborated in the, the in this section and the next. Most treatments of two's complement representation focuses on the rules for producing negative numbers with no, no formal proof that the scheme is valid. Instead, our presentation of two's complement integers in this section and section 11.3 is based on one of the references that is given in the textbook. So we have the, the proofs from, from that source which suggests that the two's complement representation is best understood by defining it in terms of a weighted sum of bits, as we did previously for unsigned and signed magnitude representation. The advantage of this treatment is that it does not leave any lingering doubt that the rules for arithmetic operation and two's complement notation may not work for some special cases. Here we have a table um, that is 11.2, uh, that compares the, the sign magnitude and two's complement rep representation for four bit integers. So recall four bits together, we could show this in hexadecimal, but it wouldn't be as clear as we're trying to talk about the specifics of what's going on on a bit by bit basis. Although two's complement is an awkward representation from the human point of view, we will see that it facilitates the most important arithmetic operations additions and subtractions. For this reason, it is almost universally used as the process of representation for integers. A useful illustration of the nature of the two's complement representation is a value box in which the value on the far right in the box is one, that is two to the zero, and each succeeding position to the left is a doubling in value until the left position, which is neg negated. As you can see in figure 11.2, that 11.2a, this is the figure we're showing, the most negative two's complement number that can be rep represented is minus two to the n minus one. If any of the bits other than the sign bit is one, it adds a position amount to the number. Also, it's clear that a negative number must have a one at its leftmost position, and a positive number must have a zero into that position. Thus, the largest position number is a zero followed by all ones, which is, equi is equal to two to the n minus one minus one. The rest of the figure that we're showing illustrates the use of the value box to convert from two's complement to decimal and from decimal to the two's complement. It is sometimes desirable to take an n-bit integer and store it in m bits where m is greater than n. This expansion of bit lengths is referred to as range extension because the range of numbers that can be represented is extended by increasing the bit length. In sign magnitude notation, this is e easily accomplished. Um, all you have to do is simply move the, the sign bit to the new leftmost 
position and fill in with zeros. This procedure will not work for two's complement negative integers. Instead, the rule for two's complement integers is to move the sign bit to the, the new leftmost position and fill in with copies of the sign bit. For positive numbers, fill in, in with zeros, and for negative numbers, fill it in with ones. This is called sign extension. Finally, we mentioned that the representation discussed in, in this section are sometimes referred to as fixed points, fixed point. This is because the radix position, binary position is fixed and is assumed to be to the right of the, the rightmost digit. The programmer can use the, the same representation for binary fractions by scaling the number so that the binary point is implicitly positioned at some other location. In sign magnitude representation, the rule for forming the negative, the negation of an integer is simple. Invert the sign bit. In two's complement notation, the negation of the integer can be formed with the following rules. Take the Boolean complement of each bit in the integer, including the sign bit, that is, set each one to zero and each zero to one. Treating the result as an unsigned binary integer at one. This two-step process is referred to as a two's complement op operation or the taking of the two's complement of an integer. As expected, the negative of the, of the negative of that number is itself. There is a carry out of the, the most significant bit position, which is ignored. The result is that the, the, the negation of a zero is zero as it should be. The second special case is more of a problem. If we take the, the negation of the, the bit pattern of one followed by n minus one zeros, we get back to the same number. So that's something to, to keep in mind. Addition in two's complement is illustrated in figure 11.3, which we're shown here. Uh, addition proceeds as if the two numbers were unsigned integers. The first four examples illustrate successful operations. If the result of the operation is positive, we get a positive number. In two's complement form, which is the same as an unsigned integer form. If the result of the operation is negative, we get a negative number in two's complement form. Note that in some instances, there is a carry bit beyond the end of the word, uh, in the, which indicate, is indicated by shading, which is, is ignored. So keep that in mind. We're not gonna go through the details of these calculations, but I think if you want, you can just pause the video and I think you can see that these are um, straightforward to, to see how that works. On any addition, the result may be larger than can be held in the word size being used. This condition is called overflow. When an overflow occurs, the ALU must signal this fact so that no attempt is made to use the result. Figure 11.3E and F show examples of overflow. Note that the overflow can occur whether or not there is a carry. And um, E and F, so we, we see um, two examples here in this, this last chart. Continuing on, um, here we have the subtraction rule. To subtract one number, the subtract n from another, the menu n, take the two's complement that is a negation of the subtract n and add it to the min n. Thus, subtraction is achieved using addition as illustrated in figure 11.4, which we're showing here. Um, the, the last two examples demonstrate that the overflow rule still applies. So you can go and pause the video and, and think about that for a little bit if, if you would like. Now let's talk about um, geometric depiction of the two's complement integers. Maybe this will help um, bring it to light for you. Some insight into two's complement Addition and subtraction can be gained by looking at it in a geometric de depiction, as we're showing here in figure 11.5. The circle in the upper hand of each part of the figure is formed by selecting the appropriate segment of the number line and joining the endpoints. 
Note that when the numbers are laid out on a circle, the two's complement of any number is horizontally opposite the number indicated by a dash uh, horizontal line. Starting at any number on the circle, we can add positive k or subtract negative k to the position by moving k positions clockwise, and we can subtract positions k or add negative k from the number by moving k positions counterclockwise. And if an, if an arithmetic operation results in traversing one of the points where the endpoints are joined, an incorrect answer is given that would result in an overflow. We're showing a four bit number here on the left. For A part of the figure, this is um, conceptually easier for you to get your um, head around it, but this can also be generalized over here up to N bits. And so that's why we're showing both sides of that. So moving on, um, figure 11.6 suggests the, the data pass and hardware elements needed to accomplish addition and subtraction. The central element is a bit adder, which is present, presented two numbers for addition and pr produces a sum and an overflow indication. The binary adder, adder treats the two's numbers as unsigned integers. A logical representation of an adder is given in chapter 12, so just keep that in mind, we'll, we'll come back to that. For, for addition, the two's numbers are rep represented to the adder from, from two registers designated in this case as A and B registers. The result may be stored in one of these registers or in a third. The overflow indication is stored in one bit overflow flag, zero equals no overflow, one equals overflow. For subtraction, these subtract hand B register is passed through a two's complementer so that its two's complement is presented to the adder. Note that figure 11.6 that we're showing only shows the, the, the data pass. Control signals are needed to, to control whether or not the complementer is used depending on whether the operation is addition or subtraction. So in terms of implementation, you can see there's um, not as much difference between addition and subtraction as you might think. Compared with addition and subtraction, multiplication is a complex operation, whether performed in hardware or software. A wide variety of algorithms have been used in various computers. The purpose of this subsection is to give the reader some feel for the type of approaches typically taken. Begin with a simpler problem of multiplying two unsigned, that is non-negative integers, and then we look at one of the most common techniques for multiplication of numbers and two's complement representation. Figure 11.7 that we have here illustrates the multiplication of an unsigned binary integers as might be carried out using paper and pencil. Several important observations can be made. Multiplication involves the, the generation of partial products, one for each digit in the multiplier. These partial products are then summed to produce a final product. They, um, two, the, the partial products are easily defined. They are multiplier, they're, when the multiplier bit is zero, the partial product is zero. When the multiplier is one, the partial product is the multiplicand. The total product is produced by summing the partial products. For this operation, each successive partial product is shifted one position to the left relative to the preceding partial product, four. The multiplication of two n bit binary integers result in a product of up to two to the n bits in length. For example, if I was to multiply one one times one one is equals a one zero zero one. Compared with the pencil and paper approach, there are several things we can do to make the computerized multiplication more efficient. First, we can perform a running addition on the, the partial products rather than waiting until the end. This eliminates the, the need for storage of all the partial products. Few registers are needed. Second, we can save some time in the generation of partial products for each one on the multiplier and, and add and, and a shift operation are, are required, but for each zero operation, only a shift is required. Figure 11.8a shows a possible implementation employing these measures. 
the multiplier and the multiplicand are loaded into two registers, Q and M. The third register, the, re the A register, is also needed and is initially set to zero. This is also a, there's also a one bit C register to initialize to, to zero, which holds a potential carry bit resulting from addition. The operation of the multiplier is as follows. The control logic reads the bits of the multiplier one at a time. If Q zero is one, then the multiplicand is added to the, to the A register and the result is stored in the A register with a C bit used for the overflow. Then all of the bits of the C, A, and Q register are shift to the right one bit so that the C bit goes into A and minus one, A zero goes into Q and minus one, and Q zero is lost. If the Q zero is zero, then no addition is performed, just the shift. This process is repeated for each bit of the original multiplier. The resulting two to the n bits product is contained in the A and Q registers. A flow chart of the operation is shown in figure 11.9 as you can see here, and an example is given in figure 11.8b. We just um, show, um, so you can also keep that in mind. Notice, notice that the, the, sec the second cycle where the multiplier bit is zero, there is no add operation. Figure 11.10, recast 11.7 to make the, the generation of partial products by multiplication explicit. The only difference in figure 11.10 is that it recognizes that the partial product shows, should be viewed as a two to the n bit numbers generated from the nth bit multiplica multiplicand. Thus, and as an Unsigned integer, the four bit multiplicand 1011 is stored in an eight bit word as 00001011. Each partial product, other than two to the zero, consists of, of this number shifted to the, to the left with the unoccupied positions on the right filled with zeros. That is a shift to the left of, of, the, of the tooth places. We can now demonstrate the straightforward multiplication will not work if the multiplicand is negative. The problem is that each contribution of the negative multiplicand as a partial product must be a negative number on a two to the n um, bit field. The, the, the sign bit of the, the partial product must be must line up. This is demonstrating in figure 11.11, .11, which we're showing that where um, it, it illustrates the multiplication of 1001 by 0011. These are treated as unsigned integers and the multiplic multiplication of nine times three equals 27 proceeds simply. However, if 1001 is interpreted as a two's complement value minus seven, then each partial product must be a negative two's complement number of two n, um, bits as shown in figure 11, 11B. Note that this is accomplished by padding out each partial product to the left with binary ones. There are a number of ways out of this dilemma. One would be to convert both numbers and multiplicands to positive numbers, perform the multiplication, and then take the two's complement of the result if and only if, if the sign of the, the two original numbers differed. Implementators have preferred to use uh, techniques that do not require this final transformation step. One of the most common of these is Booth's algorithm. This algorithm also has the benefit of speeding up the multiplication process relative to a more straightforward approach. Booth's algorithm is depicted in 11.12, in this figure that we're showing and can be described as follows. Before the, the multiplier and multiplicand are placed in the Q and M registers respectively. There is also a one bit register placed logically to the right of the, the least significant bit Q0 of the Q register and designated Q1. Its use is explained shortly. The result of the multiplicand will appear in the A and Q registers 
a and q minus one are initialized to zero as before, control logic scans of the bits of the multiplier one at a time. Now, as each bit is examined, the, the bit to the right is also examined. If the two, two bits are the same, um, one dash one or zero dash zero, then all of the bits of the A, Q, and Q minus one registered are shifted to the right one bit. If the, if the two bits differ, then the multiple can is added to or subtracted from the A register, depending on whether the two bits are zero one or one zero. Following the addition or subtraction, the right shift occurs. In either case, the, the, the right shift is such that a leftmost bit of A, of a namely a n minus one, not only is shifted, but a n minus two, uh, shifted, namely a n minus one, not only is shifted into a n minus one, but also remains in a n minus one. This is required to prevent the sign of the number in a and q. It is known as arithmetic, arithmetic shift because it prefer, preserves a sign bit. Well, continuing on here in figure 1113, we see an example of Boost algorithm where we multiply seven times three. Um, I'm not gonna walk over that, walk through this, but you can feel free to pause the video and um, look at this one at a time. So um, it has, it is definitely something that we could utilize. And if we were going to program our own ALU, this is an algorithm of how we could do that uh, operation. More compactly, the same operation is depicted in figure 1114a. So we're seeing that here, the rest of the figure uh, 1114 gives an, another example of the algorithm as can be seen. It works with any combination of positive and negative, number, negative numbers. Note also the efficiency of the algorithm. Blocks of ones or zeros are skipped over with an average of only one addition or subtraction per block. So that's those are some good things that we want to take advantage of if we can. Division is a somewhat more complex than multiplication, but is based on the same general principles as before. The basis for the algorithm is the paper and pencil approach, and the operation involves repetitive shifting and addition or subtraction. Figure 1115, which we're showing, is an example of the, the long division of an unsigned binary integer. It's instructed to describe the process in detail. First, the, the bits of the dividend are examined from left to right until the set of numbers, the, the set of bits examined represents a number greater than or equal to the divisor. This is referred to as a divisor being able to divide the number. Until this event occurs, zeros are placed in the quotient from left to right. When the event occurs at a one is placed in the quotient and the divisor is attracted from the partial dividend, the result is referred to as a partial remainder. From this point on, the division follows a cyclic pattern at each cycle. Additional bits from the dividend are appended to the partial remainder until the result is greater than or equal to the divisor. As before, the divisor is subtracted from the number to produce a new partial remainder. The process continues until all the bits of the dividend are exhausted. Figure 1115 shows a machine algorithm that corresponds to the long division process. The divisor is placed in the M register, the dividend in the Q register. At each step, the A and Q registers together are shifted to the left one bit. M is subtracted from A to determine whether A, whether A divides the partial remainder. If it does, then Q0 gets a one bit, otherwise Q0 gets a one, gets a zero bit and M must be added back to a, a, a to restore the previous value. The count is then decremented and the process occurs for N steps. At the end, the quotient is the Q register and the remainder is the A register. So here's an example of restoring the two's complement division, um, seven divided by three. 
this process can, and in some, with some difficulty, be extended to negative numbers. We give here one approach for two's complement numbers. An example of this approach is shown in figure 11.17, which we have on the, the display here. The reader will note from figure 11.17 that minus seven divided by three and seven divided by minus three produce different remainders. We see that the, the, the magnitudes of Q and R are unaffected by the input signals and that the, the sign of Q and R are e easily derivable from the signs of D and V. S um, specifically sine R equals sine D and sine Q equals sine D times sine V. Hence, one way to do two's complement division is to convert the operands into unsigned values and at the end to account for the signs B by complementation where, where needed. This is the method of choice for the, the restoring division algorithm. With a fixed point notation, um, that is two's complement, it is possible to represent a range of positive and negative integers centered on or, or near zero by assuming a fixed binary or radix point. This format allows the representation of numbers with a fractional component as well. This approach has limitations. Very large numbers cannot be represented, nor can very small fractions. Furthermore, the fractional part of a of the quotient in a division of two numbers could be lost. For, for decimal numbers, we get around this limitation by using the scientific notation. Thus, if we take a very large number, um, we can just um, have it represented with um, the first couple digits and have it times 10 to the something to have that representation. So what if we, um, what we have done in effect is dynamically to slide the decimal point to a convenient location and use the exponent of 10 to keep track of that decimal point. This allows a range of very large and very small numbers to be represented with only a few digits. The same approach can be taken with binary numbers. So this is what that would look like. Um, a typical, here's a 30, typical 32-bit floating point format. Um, so the principles used in, to, in representing the binary floating point numbers are, are best explained with an example. Figure 11.18a shows a typical 32-bit um, format. The leftmost bit stores a sign of the, the number, zero equals positive, one equals negative. The exponent value is stored in the next eight bits. This representation is known as the bias representation. A fixed value called the bias is subtracted from the field to get the, the true exponent value. Typically, the bias equals two to the k minus one minus one, where k is the number of bits in the binary exponent. In this case, the, the eight bit field yields the numbers of zero through 255. With a bias of 127, that is two to the seventh minus one, um, the true exponent values are in the range of minus 127 to plus 128. In this example, the base is assumed to be two. Um, table 11.2 shows the, the bias representation for four bit integers. Note that when the, the bit of a bias representation are treated as unsigned integers, uh, the relative magnitudes of the numbers do not change. For example, in both biased and unsigned representation, the largest number is 1111 and the smallest number is 0000. This is not true of sign magnitude or two's complements representation. An advantage of biased representation is that non-negative floating point numbers can be treated as integers for comparison purposes. The final portion of the word, the 23 bits in this case, is a significant. Any floating point number can be expressed in this way. To simplify operations on floating point numbers, it is typically required that they be normalized. A normal number is one in which the, the most significant digit of the significant is non-zero. For base two representation, a normal number is therefore one in which the most significant bit of the significant is one. Figure 1118b gives some examples of, of numbers stored in this format. 
for example, for each example on the left to the binary number is the center is the corresponding bit pattern. On the right is the decimal value. Note the, the following features. A sign is stored in the first bit of the, the, the word. The first bit of the, the true significant is always one and need not be stored in the significant field. The value 127 is added to the true exponent to be stored in the exponent field. Then the basis is two. So that's a little bit of, of more details to help out there. So for comparison, figure 1119 indicates a range of numbers that can be represented in a 32-bit word. Using two's complement integer representation, all the integers from minus two to the 31 to two to the 31 minus one can be represented for a total of two to the 32 different numbers. With the, with the example floating point format of figure 1118, the following ranges of numbers are possible. Negative numbers, um, um, so we can see these, these numbers down here. You can um, get a chance to just see those. Um, so just keep that in, in mind. The representations as presented will not accommodate a value of zero, however, as we will see. Actual floating point representation includes a special bit pattern to designate zero. Overflow occurs when an arithmetic operation results in an absolute value greater than than can be expressed with an exponent of one to the 128. Underflow occurs when the fractional magnitude is too small. Underflow is less serious problem because the result can be generally satisfactorily approximated by zero. It is important to note that we are not representing more individual values with floating point numbers. The maximum number of different values that can be represented with 32 bits is still two to the 32. What we have done is to spread those numbers out in two range, ranges, one positive and one negative. In practice, most floating point numbers that one would wish to represent are represented only approximately. However, for moderate size integers of representation is exact. Also note that the numbers represented in floating point notation are not spaced evenly along the number line as are, as are fixed point numbers. The, the possible values get close together near the origin and farther apart as you move away as shown in figure 1120. This is one of the trade-offs of floating point math. Many calculations produce results that are not ex exact and have to be rounded to the nearest value that the notation can represent. In the type of format depicted in figure 1118, there is a trade-off between range and precision. The, the example shows eight bits devoted to the exponent and 23 to the, the significant. If we increase the number of bits in the exponent, we expand the range of expressible numbers, but because only a fixed number of different values can be expressed, we now reduce the density of those numbers and therefore the precision. The only way to increase both range and precision is to use more bits. Thus, most computers offer at least, significant, at least single precision numbers and double precision numbers. For example, a processor could support a single precision format of 64 bits and a double precision format of 128 bits. So there's a trade-off between the number of bits in the exponent and the number of bits in the significant. But it is even more complicated than that. The, the implied bias of the exponent need not be two. The IBM S390 architecture, for example, used a base of 16. The format consists of a seven bit exponent and then this 24 bit significant. The, the advantage of using a large, larger exponent is a greater range can be achieved for the same number of exponent bits. But remember, we have not increased the number of different values that can be represented. Thus, for a fixed format, a larger exponent base gives a greater range at the expense of less precision. The most important floating point representation is defined in IEEE standard 754 adopted in 1985 
and revised in 2008. Standard was developed to facilitate the portability of programs from one processor to another and to encourage the development of sophisticated numerically oriented programs. The standard has been widely adopted and is used on virtually all contemporary processors and arithmetic coprocessors. IEEE 754, the 2008 version, covers both binary and decimal floating point representations. And in this chapter, we will only deal with the binary representations. So this format, IEEE 754, the 2008 version, defines a, the, the following different types of floating point formats, the arithmetic format, all the mandatory operations defined by the, the standards are supported by the format. The format may be used to represent floating point operands or results for the operands described in the standard. Then there's the basic format that this format covers five floating point representations, three binary and two decimal, whose encoding are specified by the, the standard and which can be used for arith arithmetic purposes at um, least one of the basic formats is implemented in any conforming implementation. Finally, there's an interchange format. There's a fully specified fixed length binary encoding that allows data interchange between different platforms and that can be used for storage. The, the three basic binary formats have bit lengths of 32, 64, and 128 bits with exponents of 8, 11, and 15 bits respectively. And so we're seeing those three formats here in this um, figure. So keep that in mind. Um, table 11.3 summarizes the characteristics of the three formats. The two basic decimal formats have bit lengths of 64 and 128 bits. All the basic formats are also arithmetic format types. They um, can be used for arithmetic operations and interchange format types, which is our platform independent. Several other formats are um, specified in the standard. The binary 16 format is only an interchange format and is intended for storage of values when higher precision is not required. The binary K format and the, the decimal K format are interchange formats with a total length of K bits and are defined lengths for the significant and exponent. The format must be a multiple of 32 bits. Thus formats are defined for K equals 160, 192 and so on. These two families of formats are also arithmetic formats. In addition, the standard defines extend precision formats, which extends a, a support basic format by providing additional bits in the exponent that is extended range and in the, the significant extended precision. The exact format is, is imp implementation dependent, but the standard places certain constraints on the, the length of the exponent and significant. These formats are arithmetic format types, but are not interchange format types. The extended formats are to be used for intermediate calculations. With their greater precision, the extended formats lessen the, the, the chance of a final result that has been contaminated by exceeding round off error with their, their, their greater range. They also lessen the chance of an intermediate overflow aborting a computation whose final result would have been represent, representable in a basic format. An additional motiv motivation for the extended format is that it affords some of the benefits of larger basic formats without incurring the, the time penalty usually associated with higher precision. Final, finally, the IEEE 754, the 2008 version, defines an extendable precision format as a format with a precision and range that are defined under user control. Again, these formats may be used for intermediate calculations, but the standard place uh, places no constraint on the, the format or length. So here's a couple of tables here. Here's the IEEE formats. It shows the relationship between the defined formats and format types. 
So I'm not gonna go through in details of these. You can feel free to pause the video and, and go over this. Um, not all bit patterns in the IEEE formats are interpreted in the usual way. Instead, some bit patterns are used to represent special values. Table 11.5 indicates the values assigned to the various bit patterns, the exponent values of all zeros, um, zero bits and all ones, one bits, to find special values. The following cases of numbers are represented. For x1 at values in the range of 1 through 256 for 32-bit format, 1 through 2046 for 64-bit format, and 1 through 16382, normal non-zero floating point numbers are represented. The exponent is biased so that the range of exponent is minus 126 through plus 127 for the 32-bit format, and so on. A normal Number requires a one bit to be left on the, to the left of the binary point. This bit is implied given an effective 24 bit, 53 bit, or 113 bit significant. Because one of the, the bits is implied, the corresponding field in the binary format is referred to as a trailing significant field. An exponent of, of zero together with a fraction or of zero represents positive or negative zero, depending on the sign bit. As was mentioned, it is useful to have an, an exact value of zero rep represented. An exponent of all ones together represents a fraction of zero represents positive or negative infinity, depending on the, the sign bit. It is also useful to have a representation of infinity. This leaves it up to the user to decide whether to treat overflow as an error condition or, or to carry the value and proceed with whatever program is being executed. An exponent of zero together with a non-zero fraction represents a, a subnormal number. In this case, the, the, the bit to the left of the binary point is zero and the, the true exponent is minus 126 or 10 minus 1022. The number is positive or negative depending on the sign bit. An exponent of all ones together with non-zero fraction is given the, the value NAN, which means not a number and is used to signal various exception conditions. The significance of subnormal numbers and NANs is discussed in section 11.5. Here we have the continuation of this table, so I won't go through this. You can feel free to pause the video and spend more time looking at this if you would like. Once again, here is the next part of this table, um, the last part of table 11.5. Feel free to pause and you can review this, as um, take as much time as you would like. Table 11.6 summarizes the basic operations for floating point arithmetic. For addition and subtraction, it is necessary to ensure that both operands have the, the same exponent value. This may require shifting the, the radix point on one of the operands to achieve alignment. Multiplication and divisions are more straightforward. A floating point operation may produce one of these conditions, exponent overflow. A positive exponent exceeds the maximum possible exponent value. In some systems, this may be designated as a plus infinity or a minus infinity. Exponent underflow, a negative exponent is less than the minimum possible exponent value. For example, minus 200 is less than minus 127. This means that the number is too small to be represented as may be reported as a zero. Significant overflow. In this process of, of aligning significant digits may flow off the, the right of the end of the significant as we shall dis discuss some form of rounding is required. And finally, significant uh, overflow, the addition of two significants of, of the same sign may result in the carry out of the most significant pit. This can be fixed by realigning as well as, we, as will be explained later. In floating point uh, um, arithmetic, uh, addition and subtraction are more complex than multiplication and division. This is because of the need for alignment. There are four basic phases of the algorithm for addition and subtraction. 
First, check for zeros. Two, align the significance. Three, add or subtract the significance. And four, normalize the result. A typical flow chart is shown in figure 1122 that we're showing. A step-by-step -step narrative highlights the main functions required for floating point addition and subtraction. We assume a format similar to those of figure 1121. For the addition or subtraction operation, the two operands must be transferred to registers that will be used by the ALU. If the floating point format includes an implicit significant, significant bid, that bit must be made explicit for the operation. So phase one, um, zero check, because addition and subtraction are identical except for a sign change, the process begins by changing the sign of the sub, sub, subtractant if, if, if it is a subtractant operation. Next, if either operation is zero, the other is reported as a result. Two, significant alignment. The next phase is to manipulate the numbers so that the two's uh, exponents are equal. Alignment may be achieved by shifting either the smaller number to the right, increasing its exponent, or shifting the larger number to the left. Because either operation may result in the loss of digit, it is a, it is a smaller number that is shifted. Any digits that are lost are therefore of relatively small significance. The alignment is achieved by repeatedly shifting the magnitude portion of the significant right one digit and incrementing the exponent until the two exponents are equal. Note that if the implied base is 16, a shift of one digit is a shift of four bits. This process results in a zero value for the significant. The other, operate, op, other number is reported as a result. Thus, if two numbers have exponents that differ significantly, the the lesser number is lost. Phase three, uh, addition. Next, the two significants are added together, taking into account their signs. Because this, the signs may differ, the results may be zero. There is also the possibility of a significant overflow by one digit. If so, the significant of the result is shifted right and the exponent is incremented. An exponent overflow could result as a result this would be reported and the operation halted. And then phase four, normalization. The final phase normalizes the result. Normalization consists of, of shifting significant digits until the, the most significant digit bit or four bits for base 16 exponent is non-zero. Each shift causes a decrement of the exponent and thus could cause an exponent underflow. Finally, the result must be rounded off and then reported. We defer a discussion of rounding until after a discussion of multiplication and division. Floating point multiplication and division are much simpler processes than addition and subtraction as the following discussion indicates. We first consider a multiplication illustration in figure 1123, what we're showing here. First, if either operand is zero, zero is reported as a result. The next step is to add the exponents. If the exponents are stored in bias um, form, the exponent sum would have doubled the bias. Thus, the bias value must be subtracted from the, the sum. The result could be either an exponent overflow or underflow, which would be a reported ending the algorithm. If the exponent of the product is within the proper range, the next step is to, to multiply the significance taking into account their signs. The multiplication is performed in the same way as for integers. In this case, we are dealing with a sign magnitude representation, but the details are simpler, are similar to those for two's complement representation. The product will be double the, the length of the multiplier and multiplicand. The extra bits will be lost during rounding. After the product is calculated, the result is then normalized and rounded as was done for addition and subtraction. Note that normalization could result in exponent underflow. Finally, let us consider the flow chart for division depicted in figure 1124. This is what we're talking about here and showing at the moment. Again, the first step is testing for zero. If the divisor is zero, an error report is reported 
is report is issued or the result is set to infinity, depending on the implementation. A dividend of zero results in zero. Next, the divisor exponent is subtracted from the dividend exponent. This removes the bias, which must be added back in. Tests are then made for exponent underflow and overflow. The next step is to divide the significance. This is followed with the usual normalization and rounding. So we mentioned that prior to the floating point operation, the exponent and the significant of each operand are loaded into ALU registers. In the case of the significant, the length of the register is almost always greater than the, the length of the significant plus an implied bit. The register contains additional bits called guard bits, which are used to pad out the, the right end of the significant, significant with zeros. The reason for the use of guard bits is illustrated in figure 1125. Consider numbers in the IEEE format, which has a 24-bit significant, including an implied one bit to, to the left of the binary point. The two numbers that are very close in value are x equals one, dot, 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 uh, zero, zero times 10 to the two, two to the one, and y equals 1.11, dot, 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 11 times two to the zero. If the smaller number is to be subtracted from the, the larger, it must be shifted right one bit to align for line the exponents. This is shown in figure 1125a. In the process, y loses one bit of significance. The result is two to the minus 22. The same operand is repeated in, the, in part b and the addition of guard bits. Note that the, the least significant bit is not due to alignment and the result is 10 to the minus 23, a difference of a factor of two from the previous answer. When the radix is 16, the loss of precision can be greater. As figure 1125C and D show, the difference can be a factor of 16. Another detail that affects the precision of the result is the rounding policy. The result of any operation on the significance is generally stored in a longer register. When the result is put back into the floating point format, the, the extra bits must be eliminated in such a way as to produce a result that is closer to the exact result. This process is called rounding. A number of techniques have been explored by performing rounding. In fact, the IEEE standard lists four alternative approaches. Round to the nearest, the result is rounding the nearest representative number. Rounding towards plus infinity, the result is rounding up towards plus infinity. Rounding towards minus infinity, the result is rounding down towards negative infinity. And finally, rounding towards zero, the result is rounded towards zero. Let us consider each of these policies in turn. Round to the nearest is the defeat default rounding mode listed in the standard and it is defined as follows. The representative value nearest to the, the infinitely precise res result shall be delivered. The standard also addresses the special case of extra bits of the form 10000 dot dot. Here the result is exactly half, halfway between the, the two possible representable values. One possible technique here would be to always truncate as this would be the simplest operation. However, the, the difficulty with the, the simple approach is that it introduces a small but cumulative bias into a sequence of computations. What is required is an unbiased method of rounding. One possible approach would be to round up or round down on the, the basis of a random number so that on average, the result would be unbiased. The argument against this approach is that it does not produce predictable deterministic results. The approach taken by the IEEE standard is to force the result to be even. The result of the computation is exactly midway between the two representable numbers. The value is rounded up if the last representable bit is currently one and rounded up if it is currently zero. Okay, let's now talk about um, interval er, um, arithmetic. The next two options 
rounding plus and, and minus infinity are useful in implementing a technique known as interval arithmetic. Interval arithmetic provides an efficient method for monitoring and controlling errors in floating point computations by, by producing two values for each result. The two values correspond to the lower and upper endpoints of the interval that contain the true results. The width of the interval, which is the difference between the upper and lower endpoints, indicates the accuracy of the results. If the endpoints of the interval are not representable, then the interval endpoints are rounded down and up, respectively. Although the width of the interval may vary according to implementation, many algorithms have been designed to produce narrow intervals. If the range between the upper and lower bounds is sufficiently narrow, then a sufficiently accurate result has been obtained. If not, at least we know this and can perform additional analysis. The final technique specified is the standard is in the standard is round towards zero. This is in fact simply truncation. The extra bits are ignored. This is certainly the simplest technique. However, the result is that the magnitude of the truncated value is always less than or equal to the more precise original value, introducing a consistent bias towards zero in the operation. This is a serious bias because it affects every operation for which there are non-zero extra bits. The IEEE 754 goes beyond a sim simple definition of formats to lay down specific practices and procedures so that floating point arithmetic produces uniform predictable results independent of the hardware platform. One aspect of this has already been discussed, namely rounding. This subsection looks at three other topics, infinities, NANs, and subnormal numbers. In infinity arithmetic is treated as the limiting case of real arithmetic with the infinity values giving the following interpretations. Um, minus infinity is less than every finite number is less than plus infinity. With the exception of the special cases discussed, dis, um, special cases discussed subsequently, any arithmetic operation involving infinity yields the obvious result. And any and is a sim symbolic entry encoded in floating point format of which there are two types. It's, signaling and quiet. A signaling NAN signal, signals an invalid operation exception whenever it appears as an operand. Signaling NANs afford the values for uninitiated variables and arithmetic-like uh, arithmetic enhancements that are not the, the subject of the standard. Quite a quiet NAN propagates through almost every op arithmetic operation without signaling an exception. Table 11.7, which we're showing here, indicates oper operations that will produce a quiet NAN. Note that both types of NANs have the same general format, which we're seeing here in Table 11.4, an exponent of all ones and a non-zero fraction. The actual bit pattern of the non zero fraction is implement, implementations dependent. The fraction values can be used to distinguish quiet NANs from signals, signaling NANs and to, to specify par particular exception conditions. Subsequent numbers are included in the IEEE 7, 754 to handle cases of exponent underflow. When the exponent of, of the result becomes too small, it is a negative exponent with too large a magnitude. The result is subnormalized by right shifting the fraction and incrementing the exponent for each shift until the exponent is within a reasonable range. Figure 1126, which we're showing here, illustrates the effect of including subnormal numbers. The representable numbers can be grouped into intervals of the form two to the n, comma two to the n plus one, Within each new interval, the exponent portion of the number remains constant while the fraction varies, producing a uniform spacing of representable numbers within the interval. As we get closer to zero, each subse um, 
successive interval is half the width of the preceding interval, but contains the same number of representable numbers. Hence, the density of the representable numbers increases as we approach zero. However, if only normal numbers are used, there is a, a gap between the, the smallest number, normal numbers, and zero. In this case, the 32-bit IEEE 754 format, there are two to the 23 representable numbers in each interval, and the smallest representable position positive number is two to the minus 126. With the addition of the subnormal numbers and addition all two to the 23 minus one numbers are uniformly added between zero and minus 126. The use of subnormal numbers is re referred to as gradual underflow. With some number numbers, the gap between the smallest representable num non-zero number and zero is much wider than the gap between the smallest representable non-zero numbers and the, the next larger numbers. Gradual underflow fills in this gap and reduces the impact of exponent underflow to a level comparable with round off among the normal numbers. Well, that finishes what we have for, for this chapter, and I'll just quickly go through this. We talked about the arithmetic logic unit, and um, we had earlier chapters that went over it in um, more detail, but this was in the context of doing um, uh, arithmetic operations. We talked about integer representation, a couple different types, sign magnitude, two's complement. We talked about how we could do range ex extension, and then um, got into fixed point representation. For floating point representation, we talked about the principles, the IEEE standard, which make things um, portable from one system to another. And we talked about a couple, um, we talked about one variant, uh, an update to, to that standard. We talked about integer um, arithmetic, negation, addition of subtraction, multiplication, and division. And then we also talked about floating point uh, um, arithmetic, addition of subtraction, multiplication and division, precision considerations, which comes up um, in a, a lot of different ways that is important to consider. And then we talked about the IEEE standard for binary floating point arithmetic. Okay, well, thank you very much. That'll end what we're going to cover for, for this chapter. Bye-bye.